Okay, I was talking about Fed transparency and its value. Relating to this chart right here. Um, when Ben Bernanke came in after uh, Mr. Greenspan's long tenure at the Fed, one of the, one of the ideas that he brought in was transparency. That the more the Fed tells the market, the better. Remember, the idea of what the Fed wants to do, they want to smooth out the business cycle, they want to restrain recessions, they want to promote balanced, stable prices. Of course, their definition of stability is a 2% inflation. And they want to promote employment. So with those goals in mind, Mr. Bernanke wanted to increase transparency on the idea that the more the markets know, the less volatile they'll be. The idea, which no one seemed to realize, of increased transparency is based on two things. One, the Fed has something worthwhile to say, and two, they know what they're talking about. Unfortunately, that has not turned out to be the case. We have an example of it in front of us, um, but I will go back to the beginning of this problem. When the subprime prime crisis blew up in the United States, the Fed was remarkably unmoved. Mr. Bernanke said, rather infamous quote, that the subprime crisis is contained. I suppose he meant, well, I'll not be sarcastic. Anyway, it wasn't. Mr. Trichet said that the Fed of subprime crisis in the United States will have no effect on the European banking system. Obviously, neither one of those gentlemen on this particular topic knew what they were talking about. Because if we don't assume that that's the case, then we have to assume that they were deliberately lying. And then we have to assume, then we have to ask the question, well, why would they do that? So let's make the much easier assumption for the sake of argument that they did not know what was about to happen. In that case, the Fed clearly did not have something worthwhile to say. Fast forward almost a decade, and we have the same problem. The Fed, it turns out, even in areas that are its specific regulatory purview, such as the health of the US banking system, granted the responsibility is split, it's not only the Fed, the Treasury has something to do with it, states have something to do with it, nonetheless, as the lender of last resort, which is the Fed's basic and ultimate role, meaning so the financial system does not collapse, the health of the overall financial system, i.e. the banks primarily, is their responsibility, if not to totally enforce, at least to know. And the Fed did not know. So here we are. Fast forward, as I said, eight years, nine years. Back to last December. After enormous angst, ay, sounds like everybody needs a shrink in the financial markets these days. Should we raise rates? What are we talking about? We're talking about a quarter point. I mean, a quarter point. We're not talking about anything. Now, we're really talking about a rate cycle. I'm going to deal with that in a second, which is why this, in my mind, this entire uh, brouhaha over whether or not the Fed's going to raise is almost totally moot. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so back in December, after quantitative easing, after dis uh, which they're now discovering doesn't actually work, but all of this stuff, the Fed finally, finally, raises rates a quarter point. The world ends. Well, it didn't quite end, but you got a rather enormous reaction. At the moment, at that time, I think the markets actually believed what the Fed said, which was that, you know, we're going to do quarter point. We're going to be at... Uh, Point and a half, 1.5% um, inflation. I mean, interest rates in the Fed funds by the end of 2016. I mean, the Fed likes to say, you know, don't take our projections as projections. Well, what do they think the market's going to do? Take them as a recipe for blintzes? 
anyway. So it's very, I mean, the naivete sometimes, it seems, of the Fed thinking when, the, when they say things, well, you know, we're just putting forth our views, nonsense. The market's going to take these as prognostications. That's what markets do. They're looking for the reason to move and to take positions. That is what a market's all about. But aside from the Fed's apparent misunderstanding of both the purpose and the functionality of markets, the markets, of course, took their dot plot, their projections as projections. And so the equities tanked because equities are propped up on liquidity, and all hell broke loose in the markets back in January and February. And so what happened? The Fed didn't raise rates. The Fed didn't raise rates again. They didn't raise rates. They didn't raise rates. They didn't raise rates. Didn't raise rates. So the Fed's analysis, remember, this Fed has been talking about being data dependent for God knows how long, um, back when I was, you know, Single, practically. They've been talking about data dependency. I'm making that up, but it's similar. So clearly the Fed's perception, both of markets and of economies, was wrong back in December. Did they really think there'd be no reaction? Do they really think that after propping up markets for years on liquidity that nothing would happen. I mean, I, I don't really comprehend quite the logic in. Yes, rates are abnormal. Yes, rates don't produce sustained economic growth. Otherwise, why raise them? If, and they don't, and the Fed knows this, the Fed has always assumed that these were emergency procedures, their emergency 10 years over, sort of like the rent stabilization laws in New York. They put them in, in, the, in the, during the war and they're still there. Because all policies develop a bureaucratic constituency which does not want to change them. Okay, we're back to where we are. So the Fed was dead wrong in 2008 about what was coming down the pike. The Fed was dead wrong in December about what was coming down the pike. So the Fed's ability to predict is no better than anyone else's. In fact, it's worse. Because the markets did not buy, the credit market did not buy the Fed's projection. Let's take a little bit longer here. Uh, actually, we could use, this, these, this is, um, okay, this is the, um, a chart of the Fed Fund's futures um, implied rate probability. Okay, so look at, remember back here, Fed funds were 0.25, right? And this is the probability of up to five. It went up to 100% almost because, well, guess what? The Fed raised rates. And this went down. Now it's gone back up To where it is. This is basically calculating where it is right now. This is the one, this green line, that is giving the rate probabilities on another increase at the next meeting. Th this is actually for the September meeting, the one, uh, the one this week. Okay, so back here, remember, in December, the Fed said we're going to do four rate hikes this year. That's what we, if, if things develop as we assume. Well, why say you're going to do them unless they develop, you know. It, the, the logical construct of what the Fed talks about sometimes seems to be a bit lacking. But at any rate. So after December, the Fed... The said we're going to have four. Okay, now let's look at another chart here which will tell you what the market is thinking. Here we go. Okay, now remember, uh, let me put this one up for you. Sorry, sorry, here we go. Okay. So in December, last December, the 
The Fed said we're going to hike. They didn't. Okay, everything came came everything came loose. Markets did not agree. So just the Fed's own analysis turned out to be very faulty, which is a problem. So again, the idea of transparency is pretty useless unless you have one something to say and two know what you're talking about. If you don't, then it's probably better to keep quiet. It's like that old loon, you know, why open your mouth and remove all, what's that line? Remove, why open your mouth and remove all uh, doubt about, you know, whether you know what you're talking about. It's not exactly right, sorry. I don't remember the exact quote. So in August 26th at the Fed's Jackson Hole meeting, which they hold every year, I, I did note, I believe last week, that the Fed is not holding its meeting in Camden or Newark or Baltimore, or any of the other, other lovely urban centers here in the United States, they trot off to the, uh, the Rockies at Jackson Hole. Everybody likes a good, good boondoggle, huh? Anyway, so, in, so at that speech, Jenny Young said that, the, uh, that the, the, the logic for a rate increase had strengthened. So naturally, the markets, because that's what markets do, acted on it. Briefly, we saw the Fed funds uh, implied probabilities go up. And here are the actual rates, the two in the 10 year. After that meeting, uh, James Bullard from St. Louis and uh, Vice Chairman of the Fed, Stanley Fisher, came out supporting uh, all three voting members, including Johnny Ellen, saying that, you know, well, we might have to raise rates in December. I mean, you know, maybe we're gonna do it in, maybe we're gonna do it in September. Okay. What happened with the markets? Nobody bought it. Take a look at this chart. I mean, there's an interesting implication to this chart. What is happening with this chart? If you think about the rate curve, you have the 10-year, the longer end of the rate curve, coming down from almost 1.8 down to 1.7. Not a big move, but look at the direction. And you had, here you had a widening, and now it's gone back the other way. Here you have a rising in the shorter end of the curve. What does that mean? The curve is flattening. Flattening rate curve sometimes leads to an inverted rate curve. When that happens, you almost always end up in recession. That's a very, very powerful recessionary signal. So we're not there yet, but it is, it is flashing. So why would this be the case? Last week, and I'm going to do it briefly this week, um, we're going to go through some of the statistics, uh, the economic statistics out of the United States, which certainly do not, I'm sorry, show any need for a rate increase, as far as the statistics go. So clearly the markets, for a while based on statistics, did not produce any indication that there's about to be a rate increase. So let's, let's go back a step. If the statistics don't support a rate increase, and they don't, where does the Fed logic come from for a rate increase? Well, perhaps it comes from here. Okay, this is a chart of the two year and the 10 year uh, going back to 1990. I think I have a longer one here actually, but I'm not, uh, let me just check to make sure I sound. Okay, let's just, let's just deal with this for a while. There are a number of factors going in to the Fed's clear desire to raise rates. If I had to order them in 
importance. Uh, I would say the first one is the Fed knows, even though it's not saying, that sooner or later there's going to be a recession. Even with zero interest rates, or essentially zero, it's going to be a recession. And if the Fed is not in a much better position, what are they going to do? I know Mr. Bernanke was out there talking bravely about uh, we can still do more quantitative easing, essentially what he's saying, but it says it didn't work to do really very much of anything um, when we did it the first time, how much of effect is it going to have in the future? We can do some of even getting some, some uh, noise about negative interest rates. Well, I mean, they've worked so well in Europe and they've worked so well in Japan, why not use them? They don't work and they're certainly not gonna do anything effective for a recession. Um, People don't borrow and businesses don't invest not because of interest rates, but because, yes, you can tamp it down if you put the rates up very high, but because their view of the future is not warranting that type of investment. We're almost getting back to the supply side, demand side um, argument about which comes first. Uh, my guess is philosophically the chicken and egg argument is not one that can ever be settled. Um, and we're sort of at the same, the same, <laughs> same degree of sophistication on the argument about supply and demand uh, in the business cycle right now. So primarily the Fed is, I would say, close to terrified about what happens if a recession strikes. What are we going to do if we have rates at 0.5%? Second, I think the Fed does care about their credibility. although apparently not a whole lot. If they did, they'd keep quiet. And I don't think the markets care a great deal about the Fed credibility anymore either. There isn't much left, frankly, um, to worry about. And third, the economy appears to be moving negatively. I mean, I would still, let's put it this way. The third, the third reason is simply the lack of reality for this rate level. Whatever the, you know, the so-called neutral rate is, uh, meaning the rate that, that neither promotes or retards economic growth, the Fed doesn't have a clue. I don't think economists have a clue. Um, if you look at this chart from 1990, and remember, this goes back at the same kind of decline um, back to the early 80s. How would you know what the neutral rate is? This is a chart with a down slope left to right over almost two generations. 1980 is 30, 46 years ago, 46 years ago. Is that right? No, 30, 36 years ago, sorry. One generation. So just looking at that chart, you don't have any idea where the neutral rate is supposed to be. I mean, originally the Fed and the other central banks looked at this chart and said, look at what great work we're doing. Because the last great economic problem in the developed world was inflation from the 60s and the 70s when among other things you know Lyndon Johnson wanted to prosecute a war without paying for it so the central banks in their wisdom have successfully quelled inflation so successfully that now they're desperately trying to promote it and failing to promote it. So we have recession, we have the Fed's credibility, and we have the idea, although they don't know what it is, that it's not what it is now. Meaning, they don't know what the neutral rate is, they don't know where they're supposed to be. They really don't know. But they know it's not here. I'm gonna accept that argument. And they also know it's not lower. 
just the logic of negative rates is not logical. It's only the, the logic of negative rates only works in the context of an economic equation. It does, they do not work in the real world because they do not provide the signals assumed in the equation. One thing that's certainly true, it's been true about every trading program I've ever known over time, and it's true about economic equations. They're all based on assumptions. When the assumptions change, the quotation, the uh, equations cease to be functional in predictable in predictive abilities. And it's my contention, and has long been my contention, that zero rates are a change of assumption. Anyway, because what because what, what, what economics are trying to do? They are not predicting physical reactions. They are not predicting, it's not every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a perception of a, what Isaac Asimov would have called psychohistory. The reactions of masses of human beings to different stimuli. It is very different because the assumptions change. Okay. And the assumptions of the subjects, meaning the people, change. Okay. So the three reasons the Fed wants to raise rates, again, just to repeat, recession, credibility, and where beeth the normal uh, neutral rate? We don't know. So the problem for the Fed. Now let's go back to this example right here. Oops, wrong one. It's the same one. Okay. So the Fed speaks and nobody listens. What you're looking at in this chart and, and the flattening yield curve is a response to the statistics, which have been noticeably poor and getting poorer in the three weeks since, three and a half weeks since the Fed, since Ms. Yellen spoke in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. The, the yield curve is flattening. That is telling you two things. In this context, one of them is artificial. The rise in short-term rates, I think is telling you that the Fed probably will raise rates in December. Why? Well, they've got to do something to salve what's left of their believability. And it won't matter. The topic behind all of this discussion, all this rate discussion, which doesn't seem to get very much coverage, I think I'm going to write about it this week, is this whole rate discussion is almost moot. If the Fed raises rates a quarter point once a year, it'll take four years to raise one percentage point. Right? This will be the second. 2016. So we have 2017 and then 2018. At the end of 2018, at this rate, we'll be at one and a half. Does anyone really think, including the Fed, that the economic situation in the United States, the statistics and the economic situation around the world, and the evident, evident as in January and February, Fragility of the equity markets and the bond markets is going to permit the Fed to raise rates four times in one year. Does anybody believe that? Including the Fed, and the answer would be no. There's zero evidence that the next rate increase will be the equivalent of, where's my Fed funds chart? There we go. 
will be the equivalent of this or this or that. Is there anybody who believes that? No, because it's not going to be. There is zero chance that this Fed in this situation or any of the other central banks around the world are going to start a rate cycle that's going to be prolonged and sustained and you're going to get a two or three hundred basis point rate increase over a, a very short amount of time. Is there anybody who believes that? And the answer is clearly no. So the entire prospect, entire project, I think there might have been some belief about this, since that's what the Fed said, back in December when they projected, sorry, that's what they did, they projected for a rate increase for 2016. After all, we're all in new territory here, including the Fed. And that's the idea of a cycle is what prompted the huge sell-off in equities. A cycle, not a one increase so that they don't look like such fools. And I'm sorry, that's what it is. I don't understand how they can make these pronouncements. Okay, so back to it. So the idea that this is going to be a cycle and that there's so much meaning in whether or not hikes or rates, rates are hiked in, in September or December is not real. If the Fed hikes in December, and I'm starting to think they will, because they really don't look very good if they don't. And then they'll come back and say, we'll never do it again. So maybe with this is the new program. We're going to raise rates once a year. Okay. And that's sort of what the diverging movement on the two and the 10 year is telling you. That it is becoming likely, but not for economic reasons that the Fed might hike in December and then probably not hike again for another year. I mean, I don't know that that's the thing, but they're certainly not going to come out and start doing these three or four dot rate projections anymore because it didn't turn out to be true. Okay. One thing that has been interesting has been the clear dissension on the FOMC. Anything more than one or two, and two is rare, dissent votes at an FOMC makes the markets nervous. Clearly, Ms. Bernard, I hope they're pronouncing it correctly, um, does not think a Fed increase is warranted. And statistically, she's correct. Let's take a look briefly at the statistics <clears throat> that the Fed's talking about. Let's talk about the Fed's two favorites first, non-farm payrolls. Okay, not bad, not great. Do we see an acceleration? No. It looks, one of the things that, that's remarkable about this chart is its lack of direction. From about here on, there's no discernible direction in job growth. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. The Fed's other. This is Fed Core PCE, their favorite. I don't know why they come up with this, but let's just go with it. The Fed has been going on. Now, by, by the way, I just want everybody to know. The idea that 2% inflation is the definition of stability. I mean, I don't know. My background, as you all know, is in currency trading. I worked for Credit Suisse from the early 90s. Uh, both in New York and Singapore as a currency trader on their interbank desk. Um, my background is not as an economist, although I have studied certainly and uh, done a great deal of reading and investigation into economics. Um, it's not my original background. My original background is actually, I'm an English major from an undergraduate. But I really know, and I have looked over this for years because the Fed among others, um, has promoted this idea that 2% inflation 
is stability. Well, just by definition, inflation is not stability. They're two different things. But I have yet to come across a convincing argument, or really even really any argument, other than the simple acceptance that 2% inflation promotes growth. At any rate, the Fed is, is pursuing this 2% chimera of inflation and look at its success. It hasn't had any. Now, recently there have been the first inklings of this, which everyone who's on this topic has spoken about, average hourly earnings year on year. Well, we did get a blip here, wage inflation basically. We did get a blip here to 2.7 which had been, I believe that's 2.7, um, which had been the highest rate since the recession, but it has dropped back down to rather severely in one month, back to 2.4%. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be much wage inflation. Let's look at personal income, which is a measure of, a wider measure of income. It includes uh, this is year-on-year -year government transfers. It includes uh, earnings in the stock market, stuff like that, and in wages as well, even though the, the bulk of earnings in the United States remains wages. Um, here, again, this is not the type of chart that promotes the idea that wages are getting out of control and the Fed needs to start raising rates to dampen incipient inflation before it changes that wonderful idea of inflation expectations. My idea of inflation expectations is contained in the stock market, in the bond market. If you want to know what you think inflation is going to be, look at bond rates. The idea of polling people, you, me, business people, about what they think inflation is going to be in five years is less than useless. Because nobody has a clue. The Fed doesn't know. And neither is anybody else. What you get is basically a projection of current rates. So if you want to know what you think inflation is going to look at, look at the bond market, where people are actually staking money on where they think inflation will be. Doesn't mean they know anymore, but at least they are trying to figure it out. Okay. So we don't really have any particular inflation that seems to be prompting a need for a rate increase. Now, the great conundrum is a fancy word which means question and problem. I'm listening to this, uh, this book, these series of children's books by Walter R. Brooks called Freddy the Detective, written back in the 40s. And they are very good, and we listen to them on, in the car. And there's like 15 of them or something, I think, or 13. But one of the characters, a Mr. Mr. Condiment, is given to all sorts of overly fancy word usage, and it's hysterical to listen to it, and conundrum was one of his words. Anyway, is that the labor market and the wages do not jibe by any historical understanding. Not only is the economy uh, have a low, a low inflation rate, I mean, a low unemployment rate of 4.9%. Granted, we know the, the falsehoods incorporated in that labor uh, unemployment rate. Nonetheless, you can compare across time with the same rate as long as it's not changing. Do not, at this point, in both the rates of jobs being created, the unemployment rate, and the willingness of people to leave, and unfilled jobs, the JOLTS report, there should be wage pressure. But there isn't. So something with the historical analysis, the way it worked in the past, is not working here. Despite the fact that the labor market 
by historical criteria has tightened considerably. This is not the sign of a tight labor market. So the Fed's assumptions that the markets, the labor markets, are starting to bake in inflation, and this will soon be transferring out into the wider world and CPI and PC and everything else, does not appear to be warranted. So again, back to the Fed's reasons for raising rates. Recession, credibility, and neutral rate. This would apply to the neutral rate, and it doesn't seem to be true. Okay, let's move on to one or two other things. Now, these are just a few of the other criteria for the Fed's economic argument for rate increase. ISM, Institute for Supply Management, Manufacturing. That last one is not pretty, 49.4, back into contraction. Okay. Services. This probably unnerved everybody more than anything else. That's the lowest reading, I think it was August, since the recession. Is it a one-month blip? I suppose it could be. Why, why would that be a blip? I don't know. Okay, so those are two. Now let's look at industrial production. This is year-on-year -year industrial production. So this is on this, as far as the year-on-year -year prices goes. Again, not what is warranted for rate increase here. Nothing, at least in my mind, nothing. Okay, let's keep going. Retail sales. Remember, uncorrected for inflation, but let's just look at it in comparison. Retail sales. Is there one thing that is, that is Uniform across all these charts, yes. It's a left to right declining slope. Retail sales, year on year. Okay. Personal income, this is a long one. I just showed you that one, so I'm going to show that. Average hourly earnings, showed you that one. Last one here, personal spending. If you get a longer run on this chart, that's why I took it up. Again, none of these charts are indicating that a Fed increase is warranted, a Fed funds increase is warranted. But we have been hearing. Now, the Fed insists on justifying it, any, any, any move, by statistics. They are understandably insistent that they are economic technocrats, i.e. they know what they're doing because they're experts. And so they're data dependent. We're only doing what the data tells us. We're scientists. We're only doing what the data depends us, tells us. So naturally, whenever they talk about rate increases, they must justify with statistics. But there's that old line from Mark Twain, lies, damn lied, and statistics, in order of increasing potential falsehood. Statistics being at the top. So you can almost always find some sort of statistical justification for a case that you want to make. So I think we can take it as true that the Fed does want to raise rates. We can also take it as true that the statistical case, the economic case, the case for raising rates is extremely weak. And this seems to be reflected in the deliberations and the statements of the FOMC. It, I, I was amazed, not amazed, but very surprised that uh, two weeks after Ms. Yellen, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Bullard came out with their, yo, we're going to do it, with our rate increase um, talk back in August, 
And Ms. Bernard came out and said, Ms. Bernard came out and said, the case is really not there. Statistically, she is right. The case is not there. What was unstated in her speech, of course, was that if we start raising rates, we're liable to get to a place that we really don't want to be. In other words, the result is going to be far more and maybe more dangerous than we think. She's looking at the immediate economic situation, at what happened back in January and February. And Ms. Yellen and her people, people agree with her, are looking at the longer view. We are going to get a recession sooner or later. What are we going to do when we get one? So this split on the board is unusual. So what are the markets telling us as of this morning when I came in? Okay, this is the Fed Funds Futures. Okay, now it is unfortunately just for the, because that's the way that the chart works, for the September meeting. And the derived, uh, the derived probability is 20%. So nobody in the markets is positioned for a rate increase in September, this Wednesday. The only positioning where it rises to 50-50 is for December. So what are we likely to get on Wednesday? I say we do not get a rate increase, and I think we get some degree of hawkish talk, saying that the case has still strengthened and we're going to, because, I, I mean, has the Fed really, has Jenny Yellen and company really changed their mind over the statistics that came out in the interim between August 26th and what will be September 21st, that month. And since, to my logic, they are not arguing from statistics, but they're arguing from recession potential and credibility, they are simply couching it in the, ne the necessary statistical cloak. Because one, that's their brief. Two, they're technocrats. And that's what they have always said. And therefore, they're going to stick to it. But for us, from a market point of view, let's assume that the Fed does raise, does raise rates in September. Let's shock the markets. We'll get, a, we'll get a couple of hundred points out of down in the Stock markets, 5%, I don't really know. But what will happen after that? Since there's almost no probability that the Fed is about to commence on what they said they were going to do in December, because to do so would bring the focus on the idea, twofold. One, that we're not talking about statistics. Because even if you make the point that the weak statistics warrant one increase, there is no justification for a rate cycle back to two or two and a half percent based on current statistics. None. So if there is some sort of argument that the Fed is going, that the Fed wants to raise rates back to a more normal level, whatever that means, neutral rate, then the argument has to be based on recession or on credibility. But an argument based on recession is close to implication that negative and low interest rates don't work to promote 
growth. Which, of course, calls into question the entire logical support and rhetorical support for the Fed's policy since the recession. If negative rates have little ability, and in fact, may have a positive ability to retard growth, which I feel is true, then the premise of the last three or four years of Fed rate policy has been wrong. It's been an experiment that didn't work. If they were scientists, as they claim to be, or at least scientifically oriented economists, then they would look at the empirical data and they would move on. They would say the empirical data does not support the conclusions that we posited when we started this experiment in low rates. That's an inescapable conclusion. And that's how it would be approached. And they'd move on. Clearly something else is going on. There are factors that we haven't considered. The theory, the equation is wrong. I honestly don't see the Fed doing that. I think they're going to attempt to keep all the balls in the air, including the credibility. So, that being my conclusion, what will we look for? No rate, no rate increase on Wednesday. Putting it off once again, looking at December. Markets, I think, will, will probably even get a higher rate increase in December percentage, simply because they'll feel the Fed has got to do something. But in the long term, if they raise rates, the future meetings percentages will go down because even if you make the weak argument, as the Fed will, that rate increases are warranted by the statistics, which they're not, no one can make an argument that a rate cycle is warranted. We are in a new world and have been for some time. One increase a year and worry, worry, worry about what happens when the next recession hits. Okay, I thank you very much, friends, for attending. I hope it's been useful, it's been instructive, perhaps even humorous. We will do this again next week where I promise we will not be talking about the Federal Reserve rate policy or any other central bank. Oh, by the way, the Japanese are also meeting this week, and they're probably going to disappoint the markets as well. Everyone have a great day. I will type in my email address. If you have any criticism, comments, please send me an email and I'll be glad to respond. Thank you all very much for attending. Everyone have a good day.